about sustainability through materials innovation. Just a brief background about who we are. Uh, we're basically a consultancy. We source materials for a range of different clients. Um, and we do that through mostly innovative materials. We do have a team of basically 50 people, which include PhDs in material science. We do have uh, some material, uh, specialists, material scientists. We actually do have someone from our organization who's currently working for an organization uh, right here. Actually, Melissa, can you put your hand up? <laughs> Melissa, Melissa's working with us uh, as an intern, uh, helping us source materials for, for different clients. We also have uh, sustainability experts, uh, as well as designers, and also uh, marketing and branding experts. We do have the world's largest resource for advanced and innovative materials. There are about 4,500 there currently. We are sourcing probably 50 every month uh, to about 500 every year. Um, of those, sustainable materials, I would say about 20 to 30 percent. So that number has increased over the last uh, few years. We are trying to find more because we are aware that most of our clients now. Originally, our clients were interested in get us the most innovative for the lowest cost. That was the standard requirement. Now we're looking for the most innovative, lowest cost, but we also want some sustainable attributes. Sometimes those sustainable attributes actually overtake the cost or overtake the innovation, but we believe that if you get make the right choice, all three can be uh, combined. We do provide uh, pretty basic, unbiased data about those materials. We are not trying to market to you. Uh, the manufacturers of those materials do not us any money to get into that library so we can tell you the honest truth about those materials. And that's the reason why we need the scientists, because we need them to understand the basics behind some of the marketing speak so we can give you the basic information. Uh, we also provide you contact information directly to the manufacturer. However, what you're seeing right now is basically our library in New York. We have locations in Bangkok, uh, in, the, in the Thai Creative Design Center. We have one in Daegu in Korea. We have one in Milan. Um, in Triennale in Milan, and also in Cologne in Germany as well. All replicated, all similar. The only difference is that the different locations have translations in the uh, language of that, uh, of that uh, country. We also, of course, if we're sourcing materials and finding new stuff, we need to find them from other people. We don't make the materials, we simply find out about them. So we do keep a relatively close network of people who help us out. They kind of help us out, we help them out. Basically, you show me new material, I put it in my library, we get to show it to people like you. So it's a give and take, and we do have organizations who we uh, work with closely, um, and those are both universities, so they're, they're universities, national labs, uh, basic material manufacturers, as well as our sustainability organizations. One recent, uh, not sustainable, but idea that we had helped with uh, was the Gina Cup, the material the, the car's made out of. This fabric um, is actually uh, something that was sourced and researched in the Torah Connection probably about like, six or seven years ago. They were looking into this a long time ago it was when we first started. We've only been there for about a year. We actually helped them find the material that ended up now in the Gina car. To be honest with you, it doesn't quite work yet. Uh, the problem is it's, it's not going to survive um, 150 mile an hour. Um, speeds, but they are getting there. Eventually we will actually see innovation in a car that's different than anything else that's been seen before. Okay, um, I thought about two areas in terms of sustainability. If you are going to design, if you're thinking about what materials to use, you've got two options. Well, you've got, you've got main, um, uh, a main thing to consider. Uh, what do you have a lot of in the video? Basically, as we are using up our resources, um, what do we have left? Well, we have plenty of solar energy, We've got quite a bit of agriculture. Um, we would have plenty more if we didn't need so much meat, but that's by the by. We have enough uh, surface area on the planet to take care of our needs of <coughs> food, as well as use that, um, use uh, what's left over to grow products. Certain chemical elements we've got plenty of. Iron, aluminum, silicon, uh, titanium, we've got plenty of that. We've also got plenty of carbon dioxide, we can do with using that, and we also have plenty of waste. What do we have not much of? Not much oil. Uh, we are running out of that, we don't consider that. Various elements. We are running out of things like gold. Uh, eventually, within the next few years, we are going to have, it's not going to be worth getting gold out of the earth anymore. There's just not enough left. Luckily, we know where most of it is. It's on rings and down necks, and we know where a lot of, most of the gold is, so we can recycle it, but we are running out of that material. We're running out of copper, too. There's not much left of that left. And, of course, clean air and water. So, okay, um, given that we have those, you know, abundance of certain materials and constraints of others, 
what are some areas of material innovation that can uh, speak to that? Came up with four different areas. Simplification of materials, biopolymers, advances in natural materials, and then better recycling. So simplification basically makes it easier to pull things apart. Uh, if you simplify things, they become easier to produce uh, and also to take apart as well. Biopolymers kind of takes both the abundance of agriculture and also the constraints of reduction in oil into, into account. If we can grow our plastics, uh, so much better than taking them out of, out of oil. Advances in natural materials, what are we using from the natural world? Uh, because there's plenty of solutions there, we just haven't actually uh, bothered to look at them for the last 20 years. Then of course better recycling, we've got plenty of waste. Uh, there is a considerable amount of material in our landfills that we could profitably use. Okay, simplification materials. What I mean by this is trying to reduce the number of steps or the number of materials any product uses. Good examples are the smart car's been trying to do this, uh, the Tata car as well. Using fewer materials, we are getting better at molding plastics. I'm not saying plastics are the solution, but we're getting better at molding plastics so more parts can come out of that one mold than before. So this is a good example of how we're actually making panels of the car out of plastic, so you no longer need metal plus paint, and metal plus probably seven layers of paint, given most modern cars. You can now actually mold it in one piece, and the material can then be pulled off and then recycled relatively easily. So it's taking what used to be perhaps six or seven steps into one step and making that easily recyclable. We're getting better at making plastics look like metals. Um, whether that's a good thing, I'm not sure, but um, we are able to now make recyclable plastics look really very hard to tell the difference between those and, and methods. We're getting better at making our existing plastics more versatile. Um, if you look at the wide range of plastics, we have probably 10, 15,000 different plastics. I haven't seen any really new plastics developed in the last five years, but we are getting much better at uh, processing our existing ones. This is just the material polypropylene. Polypropylene is used in so many different applications. One of the biggest problems is it's cloudy. It's not very clear. So you can't use it for many applications when you want to see what's inside packaging. We can now make it clear, which means we can replace things like styrene, not a particularly nice plastic. We can use it as an alternative to polyesters. So simple change in chemistry to make this stuff clear means that suddenly you can reduce the number of plastics you would need in total. IKEA, for the last 10 years, has been trying to reduce its plastic use, and it's done so from about two, I think it was something like 2,000 different plastics they used in their products, and they are actually able to reduce that now. They use about 20 now, so it means that they have higher volumes of those plastics, they can get them cheaper, they can control the source, and they can do everything that those 2,000 plastics could do because we're getting better at uh, processing and manipulating those plastics. So innovation could come and simply just make one material easier to use in a wider range of applications. New molding techniques. I love Crocs, not because of what they look like, <laughs> but because I think this could be the future of sneaker manufacturing. Crocs are manufactured by making it, getting a mold and then squirting some EVA foam throw a sprue into that mold. It then foams up to the size of the mold, you then open the mold, out comes a shoe and it expands slightly. So in theory, you have just produced a product which has zero waste. Because if you look at the standard um, shoe mount, the standard sneaker construction, I was with some sneaker uh, designers yesterday and they were trying to redesign the heel of the, of the sneaker. And they use seven different layers in the back of, so in the, back of the sneaker, there are seven different layers of materials there, which all need to be glued together, then stitched. Different materials can't be pulled apart, all have different properties and are important properties, but are very complex. This can be, in theory, solved, if you can, um, by a simple one molding process. So, no waste, uh, which is different from any of the cutting of a last or manufacture of any regular shoe, and also, in theory, you can then recycle these back into more shoes. So, not a great looking shoe, but a zero waste shoe in theory. Okay, biopolymers. Uh, I call it a revolution because we need one. We're running out of oil, or at least if, if we keep producing plastics out of oil, we are going, they're going to get more expensive. Uh, Philip Stark said recently in London that 
eventually, in the next 20, 30 years, plastics are going to start becoming valuable materials. They're going to start producing, using plastics for high quality, high value products, which is exactly the opposite of the reason why we created them. So we need to think about alternatives. Biopolymers offer us that. Biopolymers offer us the chance to grow our plastics. Because, of course, oil is basically just dead animals and dead plants, just very old. So, in theory, we should be able to grow almost every plastic that we currently use. So if we can grow it, then it becomes um, a lot easier to, to manage. We've got a, an annual a renewable resource. And, of course, most of the plastics that we do grow, we can actually also compost. Been around for a long time, though. There's actually a Riddell 1953 football helmet made out of a biopolymer made out of wood. Cross from screwdrivers also made out of a biopolymer made out of, made out of wood, just a plastic made out of wood. We're now seeing things like uh, Scarpa Hurricane boots made out of nylon, but the nylon you can make from the castor plant. But just because it was easier, well, no one asked, them, asked the engineers to make it out of anything else, so they made it out of oil, but you can also make it out of plants. And this, this boot from Scarpa, the shell, the straps, the tongue, all made out of nylon made from a castor plant. We are starting to see electronics. The most recent CES show, Consumer Electronics Show, um, started debuting some uh, casings for cell phones, computers, made out of biopolymers. We're seeing more durable applications because currently most of biopolymers are used um, for packaging. We can use them for durable applications. New naturals, uh, one of which could be the E2E um, biocomposite. There are plenty of solutions in the natural world. We just, again, our chemists and engineers have not been asked to. Them. So, a couple of good examples. One famous, one favorite one is the ability to print circuit boards on a composite made out of soy and chicken feathers. It happens to have a dielectric constant, which is an important property with a printed circuit board, similar to that of our standard boards. So, they're, they're looking into this. So, why not make printed circuit boards a nasty material, which is even made even more nasty if you go to China and see the way they recycle a lot of our e waste by basically pulling it apart and burning the circuit board. Lots of fumes coming off that nasty because they get out of that the gold and the copper when using the connections. So making this out of a soy would at least help a lot of Chinese and Indian uh, people who are currently burning our e-waste to try and get some value out of it. More recent one, a uh, very good selling fishing rod, uh, made even stiffer and more effective by using degraded carrots as a coating for the outside. Apparently even better than carbon fiber. I mean, there's this company in Scotland that degrades carrots. And they have to be Dutch carrots, apparently, for them to work. But degrades carrots, makes a coating, and incredibly stiff, very high selling, uh, very popular um, solution. Just made out of regular raw materials we find in nature. My last one is better and more effective recycling. Um, we're going to have to be better at recycling because we are going to run out of raw materials, but there's value in those recycled products. We've now got FDA approved products from companies like Recycline and even a lot of some of the Starbucks coffee cups now are made out of recycled plastics. We can make food safe recycled plastics. All you've got to do is control the, the source. Coca Cola is now aiming by, I think, 2012, 2015, to have every single bottle it produces recyclable back into another bottle and to do that in its bottle to bottle recycling. So we can do this. We can, we, we can recycle effectively a lot of the plastics we do use. Steel case, furniture example of how to redesign an office chair so everything can be pulled apart in five minutes and everything is recyclable. It's just took a bit of redesign. That was it. It wasn't a massive change in anything apart from just let's think about how we can pull the product apart after its end of life. You do the same with carpets. Short carpets does the same thing. So you can actually recycle its own product so that it no longer sells, it just leases its product with the assumption that when it gives you a new carpet, it takes back its old recycles it completely back into more carpet. So in theory, critical mass of carpet, it just keeps going around in the circle. Those are just some ideas about recycling. Um, but what I'm hoping you've got from, the last, from those examples are, the reason why sustainability comes a bit of a shock, and the reason why we feel a bit unprepared, is because no one asks the engineers and the scientists to, to think sustainably. So half the problem is the same with design. No one's asked you to think sustainably. But there are many solutions that can be achieved by simply just having it um, as part of your critical thinking. The same with engineers. There are plenty of solutions out there if you just ask for them. A lot of the innovations are already known. I was working with a sneaker company, and it seemed like a lot of the solutions that they're acquiring are already within their knowledge. It's just no one had asked them to do it. So it's your job 
to think critically, to think with sustainability in mind, and then ask the right questions. Because chances are, when the designer asks the right questions, the engineer and the scientist may well already have the solution. Thanks very much.